Hello, everybody. Sorry for the late start here. We had some technical difficulties, but we are getting things together here. <laughs> um, today, we're going to review the SL152 from Godox. It is a more budget-oriented light, but I'm actually quite impressed with it. It does some amazing things. So um, we're going to jump in and take a look at this. So first of all, let's go over to some of our slides here and take a look at the photometrics first. So I have a Siconic C800, which is a spectrometer that we use to do the measurements here. And um, let me just kind of talk through the things here. In the second column there is the Godox 152. The W that is in the column there refers to the white daylight balanced. So... Um, in any case, the, the, uh, it does come in pretty close to its advertised color temperature of 5600 Kelvin, so it seems pretty good there. It does include a 55 degree beam angle reflector, and so that's what we measured with to kind of keep it consistent with some of the other lights we were comparing it against. So on the left-hand column there, we have the Godox SL200W, which is what I reviewed a couple of, um, gosh, I think it was last year or maybe... It may have been a little over a year ago, maybe 18 months ago. In any case, um, it it comes in with a similar uh, beam angle with the reflector, and the same with the Aperture 300D Mark II. And then in terms of overall light output, the Illuminance LX reading, which is the Lux, um, it looks like it's through the roof, like it's the deal of the century. <laughs> um, we did a measurement of 84,500 Lux in the center of the beam, now we'll come back to that and talk to that in a little bit more detail uh, as we have um, some things prepared to, to show you here. But that's a little bit misleading and let me show you why here in just a minute. We'll come back to that. Next up in terms of the overall color cast, it does have a little bit of a magenta cast. So you will need a minus or a plus three green to balance it out to be perfect. Overall, I didn't find that to be a major problem. And what I would recommend is that if you um, go take a look at the video that we published uh, earlier this week. It was a review of the Zoom H8 audio recorder. We used the Godox SL150 Mark II as our key light for that video, so you can see exactly what it comes, um, what it comes out like, what it looks like. We shot that with the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K. I applied the LUT in post, the standard LUT, and I did no other color correction on it. And to me, it has a pretty good look. It didn't, uh, you know, the, the magenta didn't appear to be a problem from what I was seeing at a practical level. In terms of CRI, it came in at 97, which is a good score there. Running down the list here, if you go down to TM30, if that's your thing, uh, that came in at 92. And then at in terms of SSI, which is actually one of my, it's a metric that I find more useful, where you compare a particular light source, in this case, the Godox, to a known reference light source. And um, what we came in with, with this uh, on the measurements there was 72 SSI. So what that means in practical terms, 100 is a perfect score. As long as you're in the 70s or higher, you're going to experience fewer color rendering issues. Ideally, I like to see that up in the 80s. And I've never seen it in the 80s for a daylight balanced LED. So um, 72 is actually, you know, for this price point, I think it's right in line with what I would have expected. It's pretty good and it's definitely usable. Um, you can see there, for example, the Aperture 300D Mark II came in a little bit higher at 76 and even the SL200, um, the original version came in at 73. I don't know if that's outside of the margin of error, but um, in any case, I think it's definitely usable. Let's take a closer look at SSI here and just let me explain that a little bit more here. So we have a chart up here on the screen. Um, there are a couple of, so, so let me just kind of talk you through this and explain what it means. So the, the clear bars refer to um, the expected amount of that particular frequency of light output. Um, and then the colored bars refer to what we actually measured with the light that we're using. And you can see there, and this is not unusual with daylight balanced LED lights, but you can see there's a ton more blue than you would actually find in regular real daylight. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. You can see we're also missing some things down in the 380 to 420 range, and that's also not uncommon at all with LED lights. But you can see once we get to 500 nanometers and higher, it's actually, it follows pretty closely, so it's pretty good overall. And I think that's why you're seeing like skin tones, for example, are looking pretty solid and uh, everything's looking pretty good there. All right, so what I wanna do here is um, I prepare, it's hard to show a light 
in my little live stream space here. <laughs> we'll come back and I'll give you kind of a close-up tour of it here in just a little bit. But what I did is uh, shot some things ahead of time that I could demonstrate out in our studio space. So we'll go ahead and show that. We'll come back, do kind of a close-up tour here, go through the pros and cons, and then we'll get to your questions. So here we go. All right, next thing I want to talk about here is the Godox appears to have a little bit of what I would consider a hotspot. So here, for example, this light is, let's turn this off. Whoop. Let's turn my, I have a, oh, my handy remote. Turn that on, turn this off. Okay, so this is the Godox right now that is lighting the wall. I don't know if you can see it visually, but there's a significant hotspot here in the middle. And in fact, if I measure it with my meter, my light meter here, that's registering 22, F22. If I move just over here, F12.7, F9.0. So definitely hotter in the middle. Now, if I do the same thing with the Aperture 300X here, obviously not nearly as bright. However, if I measure in the middle here, F10, it's F11 over here, F9 over here, so it's a little bit more even. So that's one thing that's very interesting about the Godox reflector is it seems to concentrate the light into a hot spot in the middle. That's why you're getting the super duper kind of ridiculously high lux readings in the photometrics that we showed you. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. Now, once you put a softbox on, does that, does that soften it up and, and kind of eliminate that issue? I think generally, yes, it's going to. Um, but and so overall, I, I don't find it to be a deal killer. I just think it's important to keep in mind that you're not necessarily getting 10 times more light <laughs> than some other equivalent lights. So that's one thing to consider. So next thing I want to do here is take the reflectors off of these. And let's just measure the overall light, light output. That is the Aperture 300X. That's the Godox SL150. Two. I have my meter stick here. Oh, that's so bright. Okay, I'm reading F14. All right, and then here is the Godox. Oh, that's bright too. Even brighter, perhaps. F14 as well. So once you take the reflectors off, the Aperture 300X and the Godox SL152 actually have the same amount of light output at one meter. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. So don't think that the 152 is a kind of a deal of the century in terms of light output. <laughs> it is a deal of the century in terms of a quality light, but it does have this tendency with that reflector to create this hot spot. So you'll just have to be aware of that and kind of keep that in mind. Now, one of the things that they sent over with the Godox is a new softbox that they're in the process of designing. This thing is enormous. It won't even fit in the frame. <laughs> when I measure it, it came out at almost four feet in diameter, which is, I think, about 115 centimeters, so a little over a uh, meter. And um, the thing about this softbox that's so nice is that because it's so large, it creates a very beautiful soft light. So this is this is super as a key light if you have the space for it. It has an inner diffusion panel and an outer diffusion panel and uh, just a positively beautiful light. So I really like that. Of course, you can use it on other lights that also have Bowen's mounts. So that makes it versatile and, and able to use with a lot of different systems as well. One thing that's really kind of cool about the Godox lights is they put, because they're a company that makes photographic lighting equipment as well, uh, they put this little, uh, you can't see it very well here, but I'll show it in the close up. There's this little holder for an umbrella, and an umbrella can produce some beautiful soft light. So, for example, right now I have the reflector on. You can see we create these hard shadows, especially if I get farther away. See how it's getting more and more defined, that shadow? Now, if I pop off that reflector and put on the umbrella, we can get a much softer light. So what I'm going to do is just pop that off. Let's uh, open up this umbrella. Pop that on. Now you can't see a thing on the wall, so I'm going to move this over a little bit. Now we have the umbrella on. You can see we're getting a much softer light, so we're not getting the shadows anymore. 
that we were getting before the hard shadows. And obviously it cuts a lot of the light, but it does soften things up very nicely. And in addition to that, one thing that's important to keep in mind, I love umbrellas. They can produce a very kind of nice soft light that goes everywhere. So <laughs> if you're trying to control where the light goes, um, an umbrella is not necessarily the best choice, but they're very inexpensive. They're very easy to transport. And if you just need a quick soft key, this can be a really good option. And these are like, these are way less expensive than most soft boxes. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. You know, the hotspot part in particular where it seems like the reflector is, is not spreading the light evenly. And so that's just something to keep in mind. It's not, is it a deal killer? It depends. If you're gonna be doing, um, you know, we're gonna use this as a floodlight and you need it to be very even, then yeah, that could be a problem for you if, um, if you're not balancing it or something like that. Um, once you get a softbox on or something like that, it didn't seem to be a problem at all. It just really appears to be that reflector. And I almost feel like if I had to guess that reflector wasn't really engineered specifically for this LED, but I'm not sure. I don't know, but that was our observation. So let's go ahead and take a close up look at the light itself here and uh, show you some of the things uh, the details here. So first of all, of course, a rocker power switch here, physical switch. Um, we have our dimmer here. We can go all the way down to 0%, all the way up to 100, and it'll move pretty quickly for you there. Um, we do have some effects. Uh, this is a single color light, though. This is a 5600 Kelvin light, so you don't get quite as many effects. You can't do things like fire very well <laughs> if you're just having a daylight balanced light, but um, you do have a few different things here. Um, for example, there's sort of a kind of like a faulty bulb kind of thing. Um, there's just a flashing light, a slower flashing light, um, slightly faster flashing light, something that's more like a paparazzi, kind of like photographic flash, um, so on and so forth. So there's not uh, not a whole lot you can do with that, but but there are some options there if you need those. The group and channel buttons just allow you to modify uh, which group and channel that this particular light is going to be talking on. And you can see here is our remote. Um, where we can control things. You can see they were out of sync. When I first brought the remote up, this was set to 5% and the light was set to 3%. Once I turned it off and then back on, the light jumped up to 5%, which is what the remote had. So <laughs> it does have ways to get back in sync and it looks like the remote kind of takes, takes the day, if you will. It is the one that uh, defines what gets set. Now, what's interesting too, um, you have to have the physical switch turned on before the remote can talk to the light. So. If, for example, you had this light mounted up on a grid or on a tall stand that you couldn't reach, you do actually have to lower it and turn the light on first, and then you can control it from here. So you, when you do press the power off button here, um, it goes into side, sort of a standby mode. I don't know if you can hear the fan. The fan is still running. It just turns the LED off for the time being. I'll go ahead and turn that back on. Um, and then, of course, you can control the uh, dimmer. If I press and hold, this is interesting, like it'll count up on the remote, but it doesn't change it on the light until you let go of the button. Not a big deal, but just something to know there as well. Maybe not as useful if you're trying to do like an, you know, a, an effect with the light or a, a dim or a, a dim of some sort while you're shooting the remote may not be the best way to do that. You may be better off using the actual knob itself. Um, the remote runs, uh, it's uh, 2.4 gigahertz, so it's using the same frequency range as Wi-Fi. So it's radio frequency, and it does run on two AAA batteries. Um, and it works, you know, works decently. So there's the remote. Um, we do also have this fan button. And the interesting thing about this is when I, let me just go and increase the output there to where it's 62. I don't know if you can if you can hear the fan there. I don't know how well my mic is rejecting that, but when I press the button, the fan turns off, and you can also notice that the light output dims some. You see that? Um, so what I did is I actually turned it to 100%. I pressed that button to turn the fan off, and I measured that the output was about one third of the regular light output. So it's nice that they have that because. That allows you, if you're doing a really close shot where you still need to capture audio, um, you can turn the fan off so it's not going to interfere with audio, but you only get about one third of the output when you do that. What it doesn't do is it doesn't seem to update the dimmer percent. 
So a lot of other lights that I've used in the more professional range, when you do disable the fan, which many of them will allow you to do, it locks the overall percentage at 50% or somewhere around there. Um, this one doesn't change that. It just reduces the output of light. So let me just show you that again here really quickly. Can't see it as well unless I do this. So there's 61% with the fan on. And that's with it off. So anyway, I'm really happy that they include the fan button. So you do have that option. Um, just know that it reduces your fan output by a significant amount. All right, next up we have, of course, there's also the reflector and it comes with a variety of <laughs> these little color effect, kind of nylon, um, I don't know what you call them, something you put over the front of the reflector. So we have one just for softening the light. This is a red one that actually looks a little bit more orange on our camera. That's a Panasonic feature. Um, here is, it also comes with a blue one, a gold one, and a green one as well. Now, we've already kind of talked about this reflector, but this is, um, again, it feels a little bit like maybe this reflector wasn't designed specifically for this LED chip, but I don't really know. Um, but you do get that hot spot as a result of it. The nice thing about it, it does seem nice. It feels like it's aluminum and uh, it does have the Bowens mount here. One thing I like about the Godox lights in general, and it includes the SL152, is that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this off and show you some other things here. Um, I like the, the Bowens mount implementation is really, is done well. Um, whoa, just blinded everyone, sorry people. <laughs> um, putting this, it's kind of hard to hold it in frame, but um, it does have a switch here to release the Bowens mount. What I like is that this seems to work a lot better than a lot of the aperture lights. It's just a better fitting. And I don't have to fight with soft boxes and other big modifiers as much to get it on and off of this particular one. So they've done a nice job there. Um, the casing is all metal up through here, through the front. You do get some plastic back here. It's a pretty high grade plastic. Um, and then it's a plastic on the back. Most of the rest of it is metal. The yoke is all metal. Um, the knob for the yoke is, is plastic. I wish it was more of a lever like you have on the aperture lights, but it, this does work pretty well. And in fact, it latches down tightly enough so that you can put big, big soft boxes on it. And we'll cover our big, big soft box in just a little bit here. All right, as I mentioned before in the video, we do have uh, over here the umbrella holder. So it just has a little retention screw with a knob that you can tighten it down. You do have to take off the reflector to put an umbrella on. Um, but that's, you know, that's okay because you're trying to get soft light anyway. So that works nicely. We do have a fan on the bottom and in terms of fan noise, it's pretty much in line with what I've heard on the aperture lights, like the 120D Mark II. So pretty similar. It's uh, not bad when you're using it, you know, kind of at regular working distance as a key light behind a softbox. Um, it doesn't really interfere with audio. If you get up closer than that, it could potentially interfere with audio. So um, that's true of most LED lights. So. All right, let's go ahead and jump into our pros and cons here really quickly and just show you what we have here. So as I mentioned before, it's a single point LED light. The nice thing about that is that it's, that makes it versatile. You can use it as a hard light with the included reflector or with a set of barn doors um, or perhaps a Fresnel add-on, those kinds of things. So if you need to do something that's a little bit more stylized and mysterious looking, say for example, on a product shot or if you're shooting a noir film, <laughs> Um, those that having that hard light capability is really nice. You don't get that with an LED panel. LED panels are soft by nature. You can't make them harder. That's a really great thing about these single point light sources like this. It does have the bones mount, so that means you get lots of different options in terms of soft boxes, barn doors, Fresnel lenses, uh, china balls, lanterns, all sorts of different modifiers that you can add to them to really kind of sculpt the light for your particular use case. So. That's really nice. And as I mentioned before, their Bowens mount implementation seems really quite good. Color quality, we came in with the SSI of 72, which we talked about before. Definitely respectable for the price. I'd like to see it a little bit higher, but I, you know, at this price, I'm not going to complain. And I think overall at a practical level, you're going to be in pretty good, a pretty good spot with the 72 score. So definitely, definitely usable. Lots of light output. Although not quite as much as we saw originally in the photometrics, it's not three times the Aperture 300X, <laughs> or sorry, twice uh, the Aperture 300X. It, in, in reality, if you once you measure that hotspot and kind of account for the fall off that's very quick, um, 
it's not it's it's basically putting out the same amount of light if you set a, an aperture 300x to 5600 kelvin you'd get the same amount of light output so that's 14 stops at one meter with no reflector so pretty good light output all right the fan as i mentioned before reasonably quiet it's nice that they have the fan off mode and it does drop the power to one third but still nice that they give you that option uh the, the remote is really simple but it works the umbrella mount is really nice if you have to again if you're working on a really tight budget you don't you can't afford one of the soft boxes umbrellas are generally cheaper and they give you some really beautiful soft light although it's harder to control it does go everywhere it uh the build quality does seem very good we'll see over time how it holds up but what i'm seeing right now feels like it's a it's a really pretty nice step forward definitely a step forward from the the one series when i looked at the sl200 last year and then of course the key, the headline feature 339 dollars us for the light itself it does not come with any sort of bag so you're kind of on your own if you're going to be schlepping it around you know to location and stuff like that so but that's part of the price you pay i guess or part of the price you don't pay in this case <laughs> so overall i'm really impressed let's take a look at the cons here then no product is perfect um, as i mentioned before there is that hot spot when you're using the reflector it doesn't appear to be a problem with any of the other modifiers so when you're trying to soften it up it doesn't appear to be an issue whatsoever so if you are going to be doing uh you know flooding with this light and you are planning to use that reflector just know that there is going to be a fair bit of that hot spot and you're going to have to watch out for that um, the remote uh, this is maybe a little nitpicky but the remote only works after you've turned the physical power switch on so if you were planning to fly it up high and just leave it up there <laughs> you will have to pull it down and physically turn it on first or plug it in i guess um, depending on how you manage that and then there is a little bit of a magenta cast as we mentioned before again i didn't find it to be a big problem for skin tones on what i was doing but if you wanted to be really you know precise about it you could just add a plus three green or plus one third green excuse me very different <laughs> um, to correct for that and get you back to zero and also over time uh, led lights have a tendency to, to turn more green so that magenta cast will go away over time as you use the led all right uh, i think did we cover everything i think we covered everything no oh oh let me show you the soft boxes so um we showed you before i'm going to step away from the microphone so you won't be able to hear me at least i'll have to kind of shout <laughs> but i want to show you a couple things number one they have a, a lantern modifier which is kind of like a china ball the downside of this particular lantern you know it's it's inexpensive we have a link for it down below if you're interested um it doesn't have a skirt and so if you're comparing it to the aperture lantern the aperture lantern does have a skirt and the nice thing about a skirt is you can actually put it on just a portion of the lantern and prevent the light from spilling in places you don't want it to spill and yet still get the kind of the lantern effect the very soft lantern effect on the other side of the light so it doesn't have that so that's kind of the price you pay for a less expensive um, buy-in price i guess and then the big softbox um i'm actually really impressed with this softbox it is huge first of all 120 centimeters uh diameter and it is faster to set up and break down once you've done the initial setup it's faster to set up and break down than the aperture light dome too so i was really impressed with that let me just show you really quickly so first of all the lantern that's pretty easy to set up and break down you just go uh, you just basically press down on it you can't see this but, um, and then you put that it goes into a bag Here's the soft box. So it comes like that. Here's the setup. And then the breakdown. That setup and breakdown is what I love about it. <laughs> and the fact that it's huge and very, very soft. So I think that um, they've done a really, really nice job with that. The, um, gosh, I don't remember the name of the brand. Flo, F La Ofus, La Ofus, Lofus. Um, anyway, we have links for both the Lantern and the Softbox down below. 
Softbox also comes in a smaller size, so if that's too big for you, um, and I understand you have to have a lot of room for that softbox if you're going to use it. So just keep that in mind. That's a deep softbox, and it's really large in diameter too. So beautiful light, um, but you got to have enough space to use it. All right, I think that's everything I'd plan to cover. So if you have any questions, uh, if you want to go ahead and hop those into the chat, put at Curtis Judd in front of those, and we'll do our best here. If the Utah two gobs will not smile upon Curtis, then we shall do it instead. Well, that's very kind. <laughs> we did have some technical issues coming into this. Apologies for the wait on that. Okay, let's see what else we've got coming in here. Oh, the light, the, the salt lamp is turned off. One second. There we go. Got the vibe going. So thanks for that. <laughs> um, what do you think of the Falcon Eyes F7 RGB pocket light? Uh, let's see. Falcon Eyes R7, F7. I have not used that one, so I don't have an opinion on that one. Um, if we get our hands on it, of course, we'll do a review here. I've, I've been... Here's the thing with Falcon Eyes. I, I'm actually pretty impressed with what they do for the prices that they sell. I'm not necessarily convinced that the quality of the lights that they're putting out is really, I feel like there's some corners cut potentially there. I've had, I've had five different falconized lights and I've had two of them go bad and need to be returned for replacement. So that's the only reservation. I've not tried the F7, so I'm not speaking that to the F7, but more of a kind of a brand experience. Um, so that's the only downside I've had with the falconized. When they work, they're great. When they don't, not so much. <laughs> Um, do you really use DMX for location work? I don't, no. Um, that's going to be on bigger sets, usually, and usually not. I, I don't know. I haven't seen it on the sets that I've worked on. So uh, DMX is, you know, that's a nice feature, and that's one thing you don't have here. Um, but for many of us that don't use it, why pay for that extra feature? So um, that's more for studio work generally. But, you know, you can use it on bigger sets. But most of us aren't working those jobs, so... Any chance you'd review the MKE 600? Oh, that one's been on my list for a very long time. Um, I used it once at my brother's. Uh, my brother had one, and it was really bright. Didn't wasn't a good fit for my voice, but it's still on my list. I do still plan to review it at some point here. That's not a soft box. That's a camping tent. <laughs> You did again, Mark. Um, yeah, that's uh, that could be used as a camping tent as well. So if you're kind of hard pressed and you're in a in a crunch, you could potentially use that as a tent as well. <laughs> <clears throat> Regarding Godox's lantern, any reason I couldn't use black wrap to control the spill? You could if you could. You get you're gonna have to come up with your own way to attach it. That's the nice thing about the aperture lantern is it has that hook tape or Velcro around the outside, and then the skirt has the other side of the Velcro, so it just makes it really convenient. But yeah, you could use black wrap um, to control the spill if you needed to. You just have to find your own way to attach it, and gaff tape would be a fine way to do that. So um, yeah, definitely a solution there. How about the skin tone rendering? That's uh, I would encourage you go to go back and take a look at our video from earlier this week, the Zoom H8 audio re recorder review. We used this light as the key light in that. We didn't do any sort of color correction. All we did was apply the standard LUT for the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K. And I didn't make any other tweaks. That's just basically straight out of the camera, standard LUT, boom, there you go. So um, my, my take on it is that the skin tone rendering is actually very good. Surprisingly good for a light this price, actually. How'd you compare this SL-152 to the older SL-150W? I haven't used the older 150W. I used the SL-200W, the original version. Um, <clears throat> build quality-wise, I think they've taken a step forward with this version, the 2 version. Um, I'm really, I'm actually quite happy with this one. I feel like they've, they kind of took into account some of the complaints that a lot of different users had, and they've really beefed them up. The build quality in particular feels much more solid to me. And the fan quality seems better too. A little lower output in terms of um, noise. So I, you know, I don't remember if the SL200 original had the turn, the ability to turn off the fan. Can't remember for sure. 
um, but I like that feature as well. The controls, they feel pretty nice. They're plastic, but the, um, the action is pretty nice. It's sort of an infinity spinning kind of experience. But overall, I think, I feel like the build quality has stepped up a notch for sure. Do you recommend this light as a fill or a key? Also, any plans for the MKE600? Wow. Oh, I think, okay, you were the same one that asked about the MK600 before. <laughs> like, wow, that's a popular mic today. Um, it is MK600, still on my list. Um, I would, I think you could use this easily as a key. In fact, I think it's probably overkill for fill, depending on what you're doing. You know, if you're lighting a whole scene, that's one thing. And then, then yes, this would be a really good fill. If you're doing a talking head, easily this could be a key. It's got more than enough power to do that. So even through a huge, the huge softbox that we were just looking at. So yeah, got options there either way. Can you make a review of the Godox UL150 versus Aperture COB 120D? Um, we'll see what we can do. We have some contacts now. This is this one was uh, given to us. I, I think I said this when we were on air, but I can't tell for sure because we thought we were on air, but we weren't. <laughs> um, this was given to me by Pergear, who is one of the resellers for Godox, um, in exchange for doing a live stream. Um, they didn't tell me what to say. Of course, they didn't review this video beforehand because I didn't do this video beforehand. Um, and all the things you're hearing are just my own impressions. So the pros and the cons. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll see if we can get our hands on that at some point in the future, the UL150. Have you reviewed uh, any KinoFlow lights on your main channel? I haven't. I haven't. No, I would like to, but I haven't yet. Companies seem to be using the same supplier for their COB LEDs. With that being said, what would you say is the biggest difference between Aperture and Godox with their products? Well, um, it depends. I think that the 300D Mark II, even in the photometrics we showed earlier, actually achieved a higher SSI score uh, by a margin of four points. So I don't know if they're using the same supplier for their LED um, or if they've done something else in their light to achieve that better score, but... I think that's outside of the margin of error. I think that's actually a, sub, a substantive difference. So um, I do think that LEDs have gotten a lot better. When I first did my, my early light reviews, I had one that talked about um, tungsten versus fluorescent versus LED. And this was years ago, probably 2013 or 14. 13, I think. Um, and I basically said at that point, and I think it was true at that point, that LED lights definitely weren't there yet unless you... I'm trying to remember when Aerie came out with their first uh, LED light, and I think it was it was the one that's kind of, I think the sky panels came later. I think the first one was that Fresnel style light um, that had RGB capabilities, and that was more of an effect light. Um, although you could use it for, you know, as a key or whatever as well. But even then, the like the CRI was relatively low for an LED light. I think it was in the, like the upper 80s, low, I don't even think it made it into the nine. well... I thought it was somewhere around 89, so it wasn't amazing. Um, but anyway, I think we're in a world now where generally the LEDs have gotten a ton better in terms of their ability to reproduce known light sources like black body emitter light sources, which are much more predictable. And certainly with fluorescent, the problem with fluorescent is that they're very spiky. They have multiple spikes within their the spectral output that they produce. Um, even the really good ones still have a, a fair number of spikes. And so um, I think we're getting I think we're getting in a much better spot than we were before. So LEDs, yeah, I think, you know, I haven't measured an LED light that had a lower than 70 SSI score. So um, I think we're in a really good spot now of days. So I think the difference is largely going to be build quality features from this point on. What would you go? Uh, would you go for one of the eight x eight butterfly diffuser or two four x fours? Well, it depends on how large your space is. An eight by eight's a big piece of uh, <laughs> diffusion. Um, I mean, a butterfly is a beautiful look, uh, but if you don't have the space for it, then it's not very useful. So, I think in my work and corporate work and in the small studio that I have here, four x fours would be more useful. So that that would be my take on that, Alan. Best small LED hair light that comes with a remote. Oh, that comes with a remote. I haven't seen a lot of small ones with remotes except for the Aperture MC. Um, I'm using today the Lupo Smart Panel, I think it's called. It's made for on camera. Um, I actually have it hanging from one of my uh, base trap 
sound clouds that kind of are up on the ceiling and uh, it's on a gorilla pod type thing hanging from that <laughs> putting the light on on my head here um, but it does not have a remote it's my it's actually my favorite small light for throwing light a large distance the, th the trick is is things like the the backlights here the leds are actually um, aperture mcs which i really like for that purpose but the problem with those is they have a very wide beam angle so they don't throw the light very far the lupo smart panel has those little lenses around each led and so it has a 40 degree beam angle so it's able to push that light quite a ways so that's what i like for um, using that that small light as a hair light for example it works pretty well but I, other than the aperture mcs i don't know of any with a remote just just not familiar with any there may be some out there i just don't, don't know all right does do those modifiers affect the color temp um tint they didn't appear to um, certainly not to the eye and in the measurements i did it didn't appear to affect the photometrics in any sort of uh, the output it affected of course but the color it didn't appear to have you thought of making a video for audio recorders that attach to shoe mount and compare the audio quality coming out of those um well we've done a lot of audio reviews <laughs> a lot of audio recorder reviews and, and interface reviews i did one a long time ago with audio adapters so those are like the the beach techs and things like that ceremonic makes some as well um so those would be shoe mount actually typically i think they could either fit in the shoe of your camera or they could be mounted on top of uh, your camera could be mounted on top of them um, we did that review quite some time ago i don't know if that's the kind you're talking about so but you're talking about recorders. I guess that would be the Zoom F series and the Mix Pre series from Sound Devices. Um, also the Tascam, the 60 and the 70D. Those are both kind of a little long in the tooth. I'd love to see Tascam do some updates on those. Um, just qu improve the quality of the preamps a little bit. Those are still a great deal. Um, nice to see them updated. But 701D, I guess, is another one from Tascam. I haven't put them all in one video, but I have compared them. I would say that if you're on a tight budget, the, to me, the best one that I'm aware of um, for the $200 range would probably still be the Tascam 60D Mark II. Um, I'm not as fond as you, of using the Zoom Handy recorders for that purpose because they're just an awkward shape for that. Not that they're bad recorders. They're just not, they just don't fit well for that uh, just a form factor just doesn't work. <laughs> so anyway, those are some thoughts there. And maybe we can do a, a meta review at some point as well. How do you think the light would work attached to an aperture spotlight? Um, I didn't have time to try that, but at some point I'll give that a go. And um, we'll see how that goes. Now the aperture spotlight you have to remember is made specifically for aperture lights. And the LED sizes are a little bit different from light to light and the shapes are a little different as well. Um, I think it would work fine. Um, but maybe not. We'll have to, we'll have to give that a try. Just haven't had an opportunity to do that yet. Sorry for off topic question, but would the Rode NTG5 make for a decent podcast mic? Thank you for your content. Yes, I think it would make a great podcast mic. It just, whether or not it suits your, your particular voice, I think to me, that's the kind of the most important thing, um, whether it suits your voice or not. I would also be careful about using condenser mics in untreated spaces, um, I, well, actually, I guess the, the, the NTG5 would work pretty well in that case, I think. But I would try to tame some some of the reflections in the room if you're going to be working in a room where you do have that echoey, reverby kind of sound. Um, other than that, it should be fine. Yeah. What do you think the best soft light setup for travel? Ooh. Well, um, for my corporate work, I almost always grab panels, LED panels. I have 30s and 60s, so those are basically one by ones or two by two or two by ones. Um, I find those the most convenient when I'm a solo operator. They're relatively soft. I'm usually working in really close quarters, and it's usually pretty tight framing, so those work well. They're soft enough in that case. If you're going to be working with a wider kind of um, composition, that's where things change. Those are not as soft then. And you do have to shoot them through a scrim or a book light or something like that to really soften them up enough for those circumstances. They're still good in that case, but then you have to carry a lot more stuff and set up a lot more stuff. Um, so I like those because they're self-contained. They're all they're just one unit itself plus the power cable. And I can fit that on my cart, get it into the rooms I need to get it into, set it up quickly, and go. 
The trick with these single point lights uh, in those circumstances, for my corporate work at least, is that the spaces are usually too tight to really fit those big soft boxes, and they take longer to set up because you have the light, and then you have the modifier as well, and then you, your space constrained. So that's why that's the only reason I don't prefer to use these is well, and then I have to schlep everything too. <laughs> so having to schlep just a light versus a light and a soft box. Um, it's just usually easier for me to do the the panels and I can usually get the look I need in those circumstances. So that's that's very much a subjective response from my perspective where I'm at. But I think you can use other lights that would be, I mean, this would be great for that as well if you've got the space. Great live stream. Can you make a comparison between same size 120 centimeter octabox versus deep parabolic softbox with and without grids, light spread and rendering on the face? Um, yeah, as soon as I get my hands on some, <laughs> we, uh, we're, we're going to be around. We're still making videos, so um, I don't have any of those on hand right now. The Light Dome 2 is not that big, and it's a deep, it's, it would be considered a deep parabolic, I would believe, uh, I think. And then I think this one here is a deep parabolic as well. Um, I haven't worked as, with as many of the kind of the octaboxes, the, the, the not so deep, the shallower ones, um, that are often a lot larger. I'd um, like to get my hands on some and try some of those as well. Great idea. Appreciate the input and definitely will keep that in mind. What do you think about the Godox FV150? Um, I have not used the FV150, so I don't know. Um, but the guys at Pergear seem pretty enthused to send me lots of lights. So as time allows, we'll probably do some more reviews over time. Any tutorials for sound treatment coming from you? Ooh. Um, well, I did some videos a long time ago on my channel talking about these. You can see these sound panels here. These are not DIY. These were actually purchased. So these are from a company called GIK Acoustics. I don't have, ex well, I have experience building my own, but it was a failure. So I haven't made a video about it. Um, <laughs> I used, um, but I also have some, you know, you can buy something like a Roxol uh, Safe and Sound, which is basically a rock wool. I'd be careful about that though, because you don't want to be breathing that stuff. So you definitely need to cover it entirely. Um, and definitely wear a mask when you're putting it together. But it does a pretty decent job of also absorbing um, broadband. Not as low as low frequency as these can also manage, but pretty decently. So if that's if you're looking for a DIY, um, there are lots of tutorials out there on that. I would I would go from the best I've found for um, for DIY was a guy named Yesco J E S C O. He, he has a channel he calls, I think, or a website he calls Acoustic Insider. He has some of the best advice that I've seen as far as um, sound treatment is concerned for rooms. So definitely check out his, I think it's called, I think the YouTube channel is called Acoustics Insider or it's Yesco, J-E-S-C-O. A video on your most recommended lights in different price categories would be appreciated. Okay, we can do something like that. Definitely. What are you using for this live stream? I love the sound. So uh, sound-wise, we're using an Earthworks SR314 right here. And uh, that is going into, <laughs> this is not a cheap setup. So let me just close it first of all. This is like a seven or, I think it's a $700 microphone. That's going into a Universal Audio Apollo X6, which is doing a little bit of compression and a little bit of EQ, kind of take the edge off of the sibilance in my voice. Then the output of that is coming into my Canon C200 camera at line level, and then it's that's fed via HDMI into the live stream here. We're using an A10 Mini Pro ISO um, to do our live streaming here today. So we're streaming directly from the switcher. Um, that's the overall setup. Lightwise, we're using a DNO uh, 180W with a softbox, which is just right up here. And then for the light in the background, that's an aperture, a couple of aperture MCs. And then the hair light is the Lupo smart panel. So we're using a little bit of everything. <laughs> kind of a difficult question, but I'm looking for a handy recorder, currently looking into a Zoom H1N as a and uh, versus a Roland R07, but couldn't find a lot of information on the Roland. Any thoughts? I think the I, I think that um, I don't have any experience with the Roland either. I believe that. Ray Ortega on YouTube. I think that's the recorder he had for a long time. So I think he's got some reviews and I would definitely trust uh, what he has to say about him. He's more of a podcaster, but um, he's got some great input on, and he's, he's used the Roland. I think it's the Roland R07 
for a good long time. So you might check that out. I bought a, oh, Sennheiser. Okay, <laughs> Sennheiser G3 EW100. Is it better to upgrade to a Rode NTG5 or just stick with a Sennheiser? Well, they're kind of two very different tools and it depends on your workflow and what you're trying to do. I personally prefer boom microphones a whole lot more than lavalier microphones, but there are certain circumstances where a lavalier makes more sense. So for example, the video we showed earlier here in the live stream of me in my studio walking around, we didn't have the luxury of having someone operate a boom mic and follow me around. So I was using a lavalier microphone in that case. So if you're going to do stuff like that, that's where a lavalier makes a lot more sense. If you are going to have a boom operator or the people aren't going to be moving and you can put it on a static mic stand, then I would definitely prefer the NTG5 overall, um, just because I prefer the sound of boom mics almost always over, um, over a, a lavalier microphone and a wireless lavalier microphone in particular. So... Great info. Would you by chance know if the Zoom F6 can work with a cheaper wireless lav mic and still retain 32-bit quality? No. Well, it's it's a the answer is a little bit more complex, but the reason I say no is that when you're using anything except for a Zaxcom, as far as I'm aware as of today, the only wireless microphone system that I'm aware of that has the 32-bit or, or wide dynamic range, multiple analog to digital converters in the transmitter itself, which is where you need to have it if you're going to get those 32-bit float benefits, is Zaxcom. And that's a pro-level wireless system, very expensive. So I'm not aware. The only other thing that's coming out that's going to be close to that would be the, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, Tentacle Sync Track E, which should be shipping here in the next month or so, from what I've heard. Um, but that's a recorder, not a wireless system. So anytime you use a wireless system, you are going to be dynamic range limited by the wireless system's transmitter itself. And so if it doesn't have dual analog to digital converters and the ability to encode in 32-bit float and then stream that 32-bit float to the receiver, then you lose out on those benefits, just so you're aware. Those benefits are all for wired microphones at this point. So I'm glad you asked that question. Um, unfortunately, there's just not a you know, until they start putting that technology in the transmitter, you don't get those benefits. Do you do one-on-one -on -one membership for audio in filmmaking? If yes, how much or how to reach out? Um, <laughs> yeah, if you go to my channel, um, Curtis Judd, go to the About tab. On you, This is all on YouTube. You can contact me through there and uh, we can work out something there. All right. I think that's everything we have for now. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for this live stream review of the Godox SL152. I hope that was helpful for you. If you have any questions, go ahead and leave those in the comments down below. We'll go ahead and leave this video up for the future here as well. So definitely, um, you know, let us know if you have anything there. Thanks for your input. Thanks for your questions. Get out there and make some great video, and we'll talk to you again soon. Oh.